Good morning, Faith and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and welcome to our wor online worship on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost. We thank you for joining us this morning in worship. Thanks go out to all those who helped put on this worship service today. Special thanks to our accompanist, Phyllis Nelson, and thanks to John for your continued commitment to helping create a weekly online video worship service. We just thank both of you. Just a few announcements. We've started our Wednesday Bible studies at both Faith and Bethany. If you are interested in finding more about the Bible studies, please, con please contact the office. Next Sunday, September 20th at 5 p.m., Faith Lutheran will have their council meeting. The following Tuesday on September 22nd, Bethany will have their council meeting. On Wednesday, September 23rd, there is a Christian education meeting held at Faith Lutheran for parents and youth, and we hope that all will attend. We begin this morning's worship with a confession and forgiveness. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live with you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you your entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also so with you. you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis, the 50th chapter. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So the brothers approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crimes of your brothers and the wrongs that they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crimes of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, and they fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a num numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray to the Lord responsively using these words from Psalm 103. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. And a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 14th chapter. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they, are, they give thanks to God. Well, those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that we might be Lord to both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brothers or sisters? Or you, why do you despise your brothers and sisters? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Hear the words of the gospel acclamation. Alleluia. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Your sins are forgiven on account of his name. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, 
If another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, How, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, send forth your spirit by the power of your word to create faith, to forgive sin, and to grow our love for you and for one another. Amen. In today's gospel lesson, Peter asked Jesus, just how many times do I have to forgive? And then Peter makes a suggestion. He says, Jesus, is seven times enough? Seven times. That seems like a lot. Well, what do you think? Does seven times seem like a lot? It seems like way too many, doesn't it? The synagogue back at the time said, three times is enough. Three strikes and the fourth time you're out. Peter doubles that. Seven times, even more than doubles it. Seven times, he says, Jesus, is that enough? But Jesus says to Peter, seven times? No, that's not enough. How about 77 times, he says. And what Jesus was really saying is that our role as, as people is to continue to give forgiveness as more than is needed. He says, forgive as our God forgives you. And our God forgives us over and over and over again because we mess up so many times, don't we? 77 times as much as you can. He tells us to keep forgiving and forgiving as many times as it takes. Let's take a moment and pray for patience to forgive. Dear God, forgiving those who hurt us can be so hard. Give us the strength to forgive, just as you forgive our own shortcomings. Amen. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of mercy, which means that it's actually a kingdom of unfairness. That's what mercy is. Think about it this way, that, that, that mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. You, you do something, you, you incur some sort of punishment, and someone does not give you what you deserve, that, that, that punishment. And, and we actually don't like that. This whole entire section of Scripture should just be a slap in the face to us. This idea of, of God's mercy being so great that it should interrupt every part of what we understand of the world, because most of us understand the world of you make your bed, you lie in it. 
If someone brings upon themselves some sort of liability, some sort of debt, it's to be repaid. If someone slights us, if someone sins against us, well, we expect recompense. We expect an apology. We expect some sort of public flogging. Whatever it is that we can think of for that. Even Peter. What does Peter come to Jesus and do? He wants to know where the line is. He wants to know when does forgiveness end? The rabbis would say three times, Jesus. I'm saying seven. That's more than double. I think that's, I think that's adequate, Jesus. And, and then after that, I can just say, who cares? And then Jesus comes and says, no. Seventy-seven times. Or even in the Greek, it can actually mean 70 times seven. In other words, Jesus is saying infinite mercy for infinite sinners. Because the struggle for us, church, is that John comes to us and he tells us that we love because he first loved us. In Luke, Jesus tells us that those who have been forgiven much love much. But the struggle for us is that we live in a world of transaction. We live in a world in which things move back and forth, in which I buy and sell, you buy and sell. And that tends to be how we think of God, our transactional theology in which we, we tend to see life as that set of scales, regardless of which church we live in. And we think, well, as long as everything good that I do outweighs all of whatever I consider to be bad that I do, things are going to be okay. But what we discover from the parable that we'll look at in just a second, our understanding of what's on the bad side is very hard to enumerate. And what's even worse is that then we put ourselves in a place to value all the things that we think it is that we have done that are good and we give them a particular value to assume that everything's going to come out kosher, going to come out clean. And part of that is because we, along with this slave that is depicted in this parable, we're forgetters. We forget the first things. What do I mean by that? Well, we forget our small catechism. The first article of the Creed, which tells us, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And Luther goes on to say, I believe that God has created me in all that exists, that he has given me and still sustains my body and soul, my limbs and senses, my reason and all mental faculties, and he daily and abundantly provides for me all the necessities of life. We forget those things, which becomes a problem because then we also forget the first commandment because the first commandment lives based off of that. The first commandment is, is given its why because of the first article of the creed. We're called on to fear, love, and trust God above all things. Why? Because of all that is given to us, all things given to us at all times, in all places by God. And so Jesus makes sure to bring Peter around out of his forgetfulness, he tells this parable. And he tells it of this master who's decided he needs to balance the books. And so he calls the loans. And he opens up this big book. I, I always picture Ebenezer Scrooge sitting at a table with all those coins stacked up. And, and the dust flies up. And he looks up the first slave brings in that first slave, and he says, you owe me 10,000 talents. Well, we have no clue what that means unless we take the time to figure it out. And since we're people who, who are tactile, that we like to have visual aids, let me, let me give you one. Ugh! This is a kettlebell. It's the heaviest one I have. It weighs 32 kilos. That's how much a talent would weigh, and that would be silver or gold. Back then, unlike today, in which most of our money is zeros and ones, we use our credit cards, and that's how things go. We can pretend like it's backed up by the Federal Reserve and Fort Knox, but not really. This would have been a form of measurement and a form of money like dollars or, or cents. This weighs roughly 71 pounds, which would have been roughly the weight of a talent. And what is this slave told that he owes? 10,000 kettlebells worth of debt. We could try to fill this room 
right now and we would not even get close. We would smash out the windows, destroy the pews and the altar and probably break down the walls because of all that weight. 10,000 talents worth. This one kettlebell in gold or silver for a talent would be roughly $700,000 because a talent was worth about 6,000 days wages, roughly 20 years worth of wages for a day laborer. And the slave is told, you owe me 60 million days worth of labor. And what is the slave's first response? Have patience, I'll pay you back. Hmm. I wonder if that is at all possible, at all conceivable. The struggle is that we live in a world in which we forget that God is one whose first move is mercy, and it has to be mercy because of the debt, because of the first things. The master forgives the debt. He takes the hit. And my first thought when I read this parable every time is I wonder who would do that? It's $7 billion worth of debt. No one would do that. Jeff Bezos would not do that. No one would. I've been on this planet now for 42 years and change. That's roughly 15,300 and some days of life, which comes out to 1.3 billion heartbeats, 400 million breaths, give or take, around 46,000 meals. And then last night while I slept, I had to look this up, 87.5 billion cells were made, new ones. The reality is, is that my debt to my master accrues even while I'm sleeping, this interest compounding upon me. And we ask, who would loan out that much? Well, the answer is God. God looks at you, God looks at me, and he says, you're worth it to me, he says. Even though we trust ourselves, even though we hardly ever say thank you to God for that last heartbeat, we take our breath for granted so much, we assume much, and yet God gives. The one who holds our hearts in his hands, holds our breath in his hands, holds all of our being in the palms of his hands, and he builds his kingdom on forgiving debt because he must, because he is one who shows mercy, because he must. Because the way God works is that therefore debt exists, therefore mercy exists. We have to remember, church, as we read this parable that we are the slave. And he is one who's forgotten the first things because right away he goes out and he finds another slave who owes him Roughly 100 denarii, 100 days wages, 100 silver coins that would have weighed roughly 4 grams apiece. If you had a bag full of 100 nickels, that would be about how much it would weigh. And in some ways, I wonder, he doesn't believe that the master is actually forgiven the debt, so he needs to get as much money as he can to try and pay it back. Or he actually does believe that the debt has been repaid, and now he's able to pursue his own fortune. Or maybe he's reminded of this debt that this fellow slave pays, and now that he doesn't have to make any debt payments, he's thinking, oh, I want to get a Tesla. I'm going to go and recover what is owed to me. Well, this parable, what it does tell us is that our sin has weight. Our, our debt has weight to it. Even if I had a hundred silver coins in my hand in a bag and I hit you over the head with it, it would hurt. Just as those sins that we commit against one another hurt, it wouldn't have been a small sum. In today's money, it would have been $12,000. That's not a small debt. It's not pennies. Because sin hurts. The debts that we accrue to one another hurts. But what this parable tells us is that we're all carrying around that bag of nickels. And even more so, we're all carrying around thousands upon thousands of kettlebells worth of weight, worth of debt. And it's God's job to take the hit, to 
take it away. Because the mercy of God actually hurts more than any sin committed against us because the mercy of God comes and it actually steals away from us our vengeance. It steals away from us our books in which we tally up the pains, the sins, all those things. Removing those debts, granting freedom, all things that can hurt because we have our goals, we have our transactions, we have our understandings in mind of how we think the world has to work. And Jesus comes to us and says, no. He completely wipes it out away from us to try and steal it even from our minds to make sure that we understand that his work for us is first and foremost of all the things that God does. It's why Paul writes and says, I wish to know nothing for you except Christ and him crucified. Where the cross stands in front of us is the place where all debts are laid and all debts are paid because of Christ. The cross becoming our freedom, life from death and release of the death laden. Matt McCormick writing in the, the Mockingbird devotional, which I think everyone should have. This is from last Sunday. And he's, he was writing using the text, dealing with Doubting Thomas, which all of us know because it comes to us every single first Sunday after Easter. But he writes this, Doubting Thomas is an inaccurate title. Let's simply call a thing what a thing is, disbelieving, distrusting, betraying Thomas. Thomas witnesses the amazing miracles Christ performed, including the raising of Lazarus from the dead. He has been journeying with him for years now. It is astonishing that, in spite of all the glorious acts and miracles, Thomas does not altogether apprehend Christ as a Savior. Thomas has no excuse. He is damnable, a skeptic who has spent all this time with the Son of God, witnessing everything and still does not believe if anyone is worthy of the lake of fire, Thomas is. What if you do not believe? Thomas does not believe and he receives no short shrift for it. But of course, the scary and true thing is that we can all relate to this kind of skepticism. Maybe he's upset. I know that I would be depressed and bitter just like Thomas. I would make outlandish if-then ultimatums too. If, then, I'll never believe. Being God as he is, Jesus has a word for Thomas and his verdict runs contrary to Thomas' disbelief. Instead of Thomas getting a scolding. Jesus carries the wounds in his hands. And not only does Jesus invite Thomas to see his wounds, the wounds that are holding all of Thomas's sin, but also he allows Thomas to place his fingers in them, to feel the wounds which bear his sin. In short, Christ shows Thomas what's been taken from him. Christ wishes to be known to you as the forgiver of your sins, and even if you deny it, he's coming to you. He died for your sins and was raised for your justification. The one who reveals to you the holes in his hands has atoned for all your flaws, all your betrayals, all your mistakes. Though you may want to take responsibility and have ownership over your own sins, the truth is your sin no longer belongs to you. This parable church speaks to us of the freedom that we receive in which there's no need to keep accounts anymore. There's no need to walk through life seeing how we might have retribution for those who hate us. Instead, it brings us the freedom of forgiveness in Christ that we might be forgiven much so that we might love much, even in our forgetfulness. With that, we say thanks be to God. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God of open arms, make Christians into signs of your gracious welcome to both members and newcomers, whether meeting physically or digi digitally. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday school, through confirmation classes and youth ministries, and nurture new ventures for education and growth. Bless bishops, pastors, and lay leaders for their work in this unprecedented time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of lands and seas, continue your care of your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we ask you to heal and renew your earth. Preserve the lands from fire and storm. Protect the sources of food that, you cre that your cre uh, creatures need for life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, lead the nations away from the way of violence. Guide the United Nations and other organizations that seek reconciliation across national borders. Show families, neighborhoods, and nations how to welcome diversity while sharing common ground. Preserve our election season from abuse and rancor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our homeland, visit the American cities that are addressing local racism. Stand with both protesters and police that civil society may be preserved and improved. Bring both healing and justice to our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the sufferers, free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and provide safety to migrants. Protect firefighters and first responders. Heal the sick. We lift up today Amanda Trepke, Betty Gold, Ari Brings, Cheryl Cole, Clara Model, Dr. Sarah Lund, Bob and Cheryl Cole's granddaughter, Sally, Wanda Hoyt, Dorothy Morris, Gary Schwanke, Kathy, Mary Spurley's friend who's having surgery, Anna, Emily Smith, Gerald Hausman, Shannon Badger, Jackie Harcum, Janice Johnson's brother, David Loken, Mike Getty, Bernice Thompson, John Schumacher, Pastor Robin Collins, Pastor Barry Klein, the family and friends of Lisa Kyer's mother, Marguerite, and the family and friends of Mike Schofield, and the family and friends of Leo Lenz, and all others in need of prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of goodness, once more we lift up all those who are touched by this pandemic. Comfort the afflicted, support medical workers, and help prepare our scientists to create a vaccine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have led us in faith. Hold us with them in your everlasting love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
all these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Holy God, our bread of life, our table, our food. You created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and you fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your Son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. Amen. In the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and gave, for, gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he gave for all the drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people. Do this in remembrance of me. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church both now and forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God.